Bridge Connection. Glad you're here today. Uh, we're going to be in uh, Gospel of Mark, chapter 8. We're going to start with verse 14, as we ended up with verse 13 yesterday. So we're just going to do it a little bit different today. We're just going to take it verse by verse and kind of talk it through a little bit and uh, see what God is saying to us. Okay, so verse 14, Mark chapter 8. Now, remember, they had just uh, fed the multitudes, the 4,000, and uh, sent them home and uh, um, sent, them, sent them away so they could go rejoice. And they'd been filled both physically and spiritually, and they could tell their friends and loved ones who this Jesus is and what he'd done for them. So now <clears throat> that's all over. So verse 14 says, And the disciples had forgotten to take bread. And they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. So in their hurry to get away, uh, the disciples forgot to bring food. And obviously one loaf of bread would not be enough to uh, feed the 13 of them. Verse 15, then he charged them saying, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of, of Herod. So yeast is generally spoken of in the Bible in, in a negative way. Uh, when used in cooking, a little bit of yeast will, will uh, permeate the entire dough. And once in the dough, it can't be removed. So Jesus was warning his disciples of the Pharisees and their stubborn hard-heartedness. And without this warning from Jesus, the disciples might have thought that the Pharisees were really okay. You know, they, they were very pious men, very religious men. That's the, the image they had given for years, and that's the model that, that they had uh, projected to the world. And maybe the, some of the disciples or all of them were saying, well, they're pretty good role models. Perhaps Jesus also wanted to tell them not to accept the prejudiced attitudes of the Pharisees because the Pharisees considered themselves uh, superior, totally superior to unclean sinners and Gentiles. Verse 16 and they reason among themselves saying, it is because we have no bread. So the disciples are feeling guilty because they didn't bring enough bread behind. As soon as Jesus mentioned leaven, they assumed it was, he was blaming them for their lack of bread. And uh, so they didn't know what to do, verse 17. But Jesus became aware of it and said to them, why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? How do you not understand? So, so Jesus, however, wasn't talking about physical bread. That was irrelevant to him. And he then asked the question, the disciples, a series of questions we'll read them here in, in a few moments, kind of meant to stir their understanding. When Jesus asked them if their hearts were hard, he was not implying they... They were as rebellious and stubborn as the Pharisees, but the Pharisees were willfully rebellious while the disciples were, were, were simply slow to understand. They had heard things, they had seen things, they had, but they didn't understand everything. So they were <clears throat> trying to take things just as they had seen them, but um, so their hearts weren't totally changed yet. You know, we face that same danger today spiritual blindness and, and hardness. Um, too many people are attached to the, to the world and its pleasures. The world and its God, you know, the, the devil himself, blind the mind of, of men's lest they should see truth. <clears throat> As a result, people are dying and they're doomed to perish eternally because their hearts are hardened. Verse 19, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000. How many baskets full of fragments did you take up? They said to him, 12. Also, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said, seven. So Jesus is reminding the disciples of the two miraculous feedings of the crowds. The, he questions them about, what happened? And they responded correctly. All right, verse 21. 
So he said to them, how is it that you do not understand? Jesus wanted his disciples to draw a conclusion from, from the feedings. How could they worry about not having enough to eat when, when they had seen the miraculous work of Jesus and he performed so many miracles. They'd witnessed them all. If Jesus could feed 9,000 people with some loaves and fishes, they must have thought surely he could supply for their basic needs. And how about us? If Jesus could do these miraculous things, how about beginning to trust him to supply? Take no thought for tomorrow. We're, we're to do our jobs. We're to do what we're supposed to do. Absolutely. But there's to be no worry. He says, seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Verse 22, then he came to Bethsaida and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. Again, we see the intercession of friends on behalf of a, of a hurting person. One time it was, he was, a man was crippled on a bed. This time a man can't see. And so his friends brought him to Jesus. What a strong lesson of intercession. We are to care enough to bring people to Christ and to pray for Christ to heal them. And it's not just a matter of just praying for their physical healing. Do we care enough for our friends and our loved ones to really pray, bring them before Christ that they would open their eyes, they would unplug their ears, that they could hear the things that you want them to hear, Lord. And, and do, can we pray those things? Can we bring our friends to them in our prayers and say, Jesus, I've shared with them, I've shared with my, my family for 25 years and they've rejected everything I've said. Lord, now I'm on my knees and my face before you because I know they will spend an eternity without you if they do not receive you. So remove those plugs, remove the shades and the scales from their eyes that they may hear and, and see what you would say to them. How important it is to be that kind of friend to people, to our family, to our acquaintances. Jesus cares deeply about people who care about people. He cares enough to receive and act in their behalf. The caring person and the intercessor will always receive the care of Jesus Christ. We just have to believe it and walk it and forget about ourselves and exalt him. Verse 23. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. So Jesus leads this blind man out of town, out of the village, uh, because of his concern for him. Uh, probably, maybe it was, I've, I've often thought people that are blind they rely on their hearing, and so noise is very prevalent in, in, in their senses. And so, you know, maybe the busyness and the noise in, in, in that little village was distracting for a man who couldn't see. He's trying to pick up the, the different things. And uh, so I think Jesus could probably took him away from these distractions so this man could focus on Jesus so that he could end up seeing. I want you to notice, I, I came up with three things that are involved in caring. We are to care to, for people even when their beliefs are wrong. They don't have to believe what we believe. We need to continue to care for them, to bring them to Jesus, to pray that, 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 that God would, would, would reveal himself to them. Secondly, we should begin where men are in dealing with them. We can begin with the faith men have and move them towards more belief in Christ just, you know, you know, just starting where they are. I believe there's a God, but not, you know, let's talk about that, you know, and, and let's, and then take that before the Lord. And, and then I think the third thing is we must always lead men ultimately to the essential belief. The power to be made whole comes only through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that should be our message always to everyone. Verse 24 and he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. So in response to Jesus' question, if he saw anything, he says, well, I, I, I see dimly, I, I see shadows. Uh, he was not fully, fully healed. 
One commentator that I read, you know, uh, says this uh, as, uh, and he says this was a lack of faith on the man's part. But there seems to be no reason to attribute this to, to, to uh, a lack of faith at all. Um, I think there's just two stages to the miracle in the man's in the man's life. He apparently had as much faith as did the paralytic whose friends brought him to Jesus. And look at verse 25. And he looked up. Okay, and then verse five. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. And he was restored and saw everyone clearly. So Jesus placed his hands on him again and he could see everything clearly. The, the, the fact that this miracle took two stages shows, that, shows me that Jesus' miracles uh, are not formulas that we can use, you know. Um, Jesus' miracles are, are not a process that we can use uh, by any means. I, I, perhaps Jesus used his miracle to show his disciples that their sight was also growing in stages because Jesus healed in many different ways. We should not try to reproduce the miracles of Jesus through our own power. This two-stage miracle also shows us that uh, he'll never give up on us. He who has begun a good work on us will complete it till the day of Jesus Christ. Notice very, something very important here. There's always stages. Many people are not immediately led to Christ. It takes a process. No person is ever mature in Jesus Christ immediately. There is no such thing as instantaneous uh, maturity. A person grows in Christ step by step, stage by stage. And we need to understand that. Um, we are so programmed in our culture that everything has to be instantaneous. Our uh, television has to come on instantaneous. Our radio has to come on instantaneous. As soon as we get in the car, you know, our air conditioning has to be cold immediately when we get in the car. We're going to complain. Um, our, our iPads have to pull up whatever we're wanting instantaneously. Our computers, we can't wait. We'll, we'll get more internet. We'll We'll, we'll get more Wi-Fi. We'll pay for this just so we can get it quicker. We don't want to wait 30 seconds. You know, everything is instantaneous. Um, fast food. We, we buy fast food because it's fast. Not because it's food. <laughs> we take the one side. It's fast. And so we, we, we buy food. And we, we call it food delivered now in our pandemic. And if it's not here in 15 minutes, we're getting all upset. We're pacing the floors. Wait, I wanted that food here in 15 minutes. That'd be here in 15 minutes. Well, think about how long it would have taken you to cook that yourself, man. But there's no instantaneous maturity in Jesus Christ. It's a process. We grow day by day, moment by moment. As, there's, 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 as we experience his presence, we're being changed from glory to glory as by the presence of the Holy Spirit, as, as, as by the Holy Spirit. And it's from glory to glory just being in his presence and as we're in his presence, in the word and prayer, as we walk with him through life, then there's growth and there's maturity, but that's the only way. Verse 26, then he sent him away to his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. So Jesus told this guy not to go into the village. Now it's possible that Bethsaida was not this man's home, so don't go there. It's also possible that because Jesus had pronounced judgment on Bethsaida, the people of this village were not to receive the benefit of this healed man's witness. He didn't want them to hear about this. I don't know. Or it might have had another reason. We don't know why. We don't have to know why. And Jesus, 27, now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi and on the road, he asked his disciples, saying to them, who do men say that I am? As Jesus and his disciples traveled to Caesarea Philippi, he questioned them about his identity. Their knowledge of him was growing, their understanding uh, becoming greater. How far had they come to understanding 
who he was. How far had their understanding really led them? He, he wanted to know. Verse 28. So they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah and others, one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. As foreshadowed in, in chapter six, the disciples listed the popular opinions about Jesus. Um, our knowledge of others' beliefs, however, is never good enough. We must form our own opinions. We must come to Christ ourselves. So it's not a matter who somebody else says Jesus is, who do I say? Well, Peter was the outspoken of the group. He replied that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, Matthew gives Peter's response um, fuller attention um, to Peter's, uh, to, fuller attention to, to Peter in, in this incident. That's in Matthew 16. And many scholars believe that Peter dictated the Gospel of Mark to John Mark. And if this is indeed Peter's account, and I believe it is, of these events, it's possible that he didn't want the praise of himself recorded here. He wanted only his, his Savior glorified. Peter had changed so much in the years after Jesus had been resurrected from the dead and he was no longer all about himself. He was simply all about his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 30, then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. So he's telling his disciples not to tell anybody about this event. He knew the disciples still didn't have a complete understanding of who the Messiah was or, or what he would suffer. So there was just still more training to be done. Verse 31, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. So for the first time, Jesus speaks very plainly about his upcoming passion and, and death. Notice that the, the, this, this, this came immediately after Peter's confession of him as the Christ. He wanted to emphasize to the disciples that he had not come to establish a political kingdom. His victory would be that of the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. The Messiah must suffer many, many things. While the crucifixion is the culmination of Jesus' suffering, he suffered a lot of other things too. He suffered the rejection of his family. He suffered the continuous rejection of his teaching and his miracles by the religious leaders. The attribution of his compassion and good works to the works of the devil had to be a source of further suffering. Jesus listed three categories of people in this verse. The elders, the chief priests, and teachers of the law. These three groups made up the Sanhedrin. These groups would be the one that demand the one that the ones that would demanded his death. Verse thirty-two, he spoke the word openly. Then Peter took his took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at, at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, "Get behind me, Satan! For you are not mindful of the things of God." Jesus was tempted by Peter to, to bypass the Father's will for his life. And notice the temptation. It came from a disciple, Peter. We are often, we are often tempted to bypass God's will. And unfortunately, the, the temptation often comes to us from friends, probably more times from friends and family than not. They mean well, they may want to save us from difficult path of trouble, trials, heartaches, disappointments. Nevertheless, their suggestion to bypass God's will is of Satan. To verse 34. When he had called the disciple to himself, with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. 
Jesus' next words were, not just for his disciples, but for every single one in the crowd. After telling his disciples about his impending death, he told everyone about the cost of, of being a follower of his. The phrase deny himself implies that like Jesus, we must seek the Father's will and submit our will to his. Not our will, but his be done. They knew what the cross represented. When he said, you must pick up your cross, they understood what he was saying to them. Verse 35. For whoever denies or desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his own soul? I'm having trouble reading my, I gotta get a bigger print Bible, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> the older I get, I gotta get it closer and closer. And this is a big one, get it closer and closer. All right, these statements um, expand the understanding of verse 34, verses 35, 36, and 37. When people lose their lives by taking up the cross, they find life in Jesus. In the same way, trusting in riches will not gain a person eternal life. There is nothing anybody can exchange to find life for their soul. It just will not happen. It does not exist. And verse 38, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. In verse 31, Jesus spoke of his passion, spoke of his death, spoke of his resurrection. In this verse, he speaks of his eventual return in glory. Jesus had full confidence in his triumph over death after his resurrection. He will judge those who have been ashamed of him. He will be ashamed of them as well. We need to be men and women who are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the only way that will happen because we have our prides, we have our egos, we, we, don't, want, we, you know, we don't want people to think we're weird and all of that stuff. But when we, can, when we live at the cross, my friends, when we live at the feet of Jesus, when we're constantly aware of what it cost him for us to have this eternal life. We would want to shout it from the mountaintops, not be ashamed of what we believe, but speak it with boldness and truth and passion. We need to pick up our cross. Maybe our cross is our pride. We need to crucify it, nail it to his cross, and say, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to be who you want me to be. I want to share with those around me. I don't care if they put me down. I don't care if they confuse me when they ask me questions. I don't care if they ridicule me and laugh at me. I believe you will give me words to speak and whatever comes out of my mouth will be what you want them to hear. I'm going to trust you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We have choices every day to make. And our choices every day should be, Jesus, I get up this morning to serve you, to honor you, to love you with a passion that will spill over from my life into every life I meet. Jesus, remind me of what it cost you for me to have this unbelievable opportunity to know you and to walk with you. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for coming. Thank you for dying in our place. Thank you for the horrendous pain that you received during your life and the ultimate pain on that cross. And oh, Jesus, the lashings, the crown of thorns, the nails in your hands and your feet. Oh, Jesus, thank you for going all the way to Calvary for us and then defeating death, hell, and the grave. 
Thank you. Lord, let us have a passion to make sure that we live a life that brings attention to you. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Keep your eyes on him. He'll take care of you. See you tomorrow. We'll start chapter nine. God bless you.